Okay, we'll start with chapter 21. So after last week getting uh, our first exposure to advanced life support and the medical emergencies with respiratory disorders, this week uh, we start off with cardiovascular disorders. Um, obviously it is a fairly common um, call for EMS for us to deal with various cardiovascular complaints. And uh, so coupling this with respiratory emergencies, uh, we are, are really uh, going to see a, a large chunk of the patients that we uh, regularly deal with. So um, as with all the chapters, simply listening or watching this lecture is no replacement to reading and studying the chapter. So if you haven't done that, do that at your earliest convenience. The advanced EMT education standard that applies here is that the AEMT will be able to apply fundamental knowledge to provide basic and selected advanced emergency care and transportation based off the patient's assessment findings for an acutely ill patient. A number of uh, objectives that are found on pages 533, 34, and 35 in your text. All right, so an introduction. Uh, the cardiovascular system transports oxygen, chemical messages, mainly in the form of hormones, nutrients, primarily glucose being our, our major one we're concerned with, but certainly the other things, um, the other uh, more raw materials, such as the, the carbohydrates, the fats, the um, proteins and whatnot, uh, as, as they get broken down through the GI tract and then on into the liver and, and so on and so forth, um, as well as the uh, important substances throughout the body. So sometimes we're talking maybe the white cells. I mean, even though that's technically part of the cardiovascular system, uh, those that uh, respond to foreign invaders in our body, obviously, are, are going to be very important. And then the waste products also uh, to the organs uh, designed to eliminate said substances, primarily the liver and the kidneys uh, are the primary ones. But also remember that one of the waste products that we create is carbon dioxide, and carbon dioxide is disposed of in the lungs. So anything that interferes with that ability of the heart and the blood vessels to transport blood to and from the tissue compromises body function. I brought this up time and time again, but I'll, I'll bring it up once again because I'm sure you're not sick of hearing me say it. Think about living in a house and what you continue to bring in groceries, you continue to bring in stuff, but you never take out any garbage, you never take out any waste. How unpleasant does that environment become very quickly? So uh, likewise, if you can't bring anything in, uh, then you really are, are not going to be able to, to survive long uh, in that manner either. So an AEMT really needs to quickly recognize the various signs and symptoms of cardiovascular emergencies and then provide prompt treatment. And then also understand that anatomy and physiology of the heart and the pathophysiology of the cardiovascular diseases. All right, so in, in a brief review here, uh, if you actually will look first to page 535 in your text, it reminds us where exactly we can find our heart. Um, and, and take a moment to, to look at that. If you look at it, you can see that um, you know the lungs fill up really a significant portion of the uh, inside the rib cage uh, in the thoracic cavity. The heart basically is laying right on top of the diaphragm. The stomach is just below the diaphragm there, so right where you can see the arrow from apex uh, pointing to uh, the heart, uh, right underneath that is the stomach. Um, and then of course it lies just slightly off to the left side. Um, the heart is almost uh, tipped over, it almost lays a little bit more on its right side, uh, and the left side is a little more upward than anything. So then as we go in and we look to, to, uh, to this picture, 
Now this uh, reminds us of the blood flow through the heart, also found on 536 in your text. But it reminds us of the blood flow through the heart, remembering that the right side of the heart is primarily responsible for deoxygenated blood, the left side of the heart for oxygenated blood. The heart has four chambers, two atria, which are the upper chambers, two ventricles, which are the lower chambers. Atria are receiving, or I like to think of them more as a reservoir, um, and the ventricles, the lower chambers, are the pumping chambers. The right side receives blood from, uh, deoxygenated blood from the body, from either the superior or the inferior vena cava, or actually from both at the same time, uh, on either. But uh, from those that uh, return blood from uh, their respective areas of the body dumps into the right atria, down through the tricuspid valve, try it before you buy it, if you can have a hard time remembering. Uh, so the tricuspid valve uh, into the right ventricle. Uh, the tricuspid valve is uh, assisted uh, working via the papillary muscles or the papilla muscles and the chordae tendinae, which are kind of like parachute cords uh, that uh, attach the, to the papilla muscles. Um, the ventricle contracts, it pushes blood up through the pulmonic valve, and that pulmonic valve then splits that blood and sends some of it to the right lung, some of it to the left lung, where it gets all the way down to the alveolar level and the capillary level, of course, does the, the appropriate gas exchange, is fed back to the heart via the pulmonary veins, so the left and the right pulmonary veins. Uh, they take and they'll dump the blood into the left atria. That left atria uh, will then deposit the blood into the left ventricle through the bicuspid or often referred to as the mitral valve. It works under the same uh, principle with chordae tendinae and the papillary muscles. Um, the aortic and the pulmonic valves don't work off the same principle. Uh, they're more of a uh, of a um, check valve where they'll allow blood to kind of push through easily but not to backflow. And then um, through from the left ventricle pumped up through the aortic valve into the aorta. Just as the aorta comes off the heart, the coronary vessels, uh, the coronary arteries actually uh, come off of there. If you look at 537 in your text, um, and actually this picture is coming up here in a, in a minute, but uh, if we look at 537, we can take a look and see the right coronary artery, left coronary artery, and see how those basically attach right there at the base of the aorta. So we'll talk about how those get uh, uh, circulated uh, after a bit. So the heart is in the mediastinum, which is uh, the center of the chest uh, between the lungs is where you find the greater vessels, the uh, uh, trachea, of course, uh, the main stem bronchi, the esophagus. Uh, there's some other lymphatics and whatnot in there, but uh, it's primarily the area between the lungs. <coughs> uh, the thymus gland, gland is also in there, which we'll talk about at another time. Um, we talked about atria, we talked about ventricles, myocardium, endocardium, pericardium, epicardium. So we've got a lot of different layers here to talk about. Um, I'll uh, draw your attention back to the previous picture on 536, uh, and we'll kind of take a look at that, that. You can see that the thickest part of the muscle, so let's look down uh, at the uh, right lower uh, part of this picture here. And they're really pointing towards the wall of the right, I'm sorry, left ventricle. Um, you can see myocardium. Myocardium is the muscle. That's the thickest, heaviest part of uh, the heart. The inside lining, or where the what part of the heart comes into contact with the blood, is the endocardium. Okay, so it is the inner lining or the inner layer uh, is the endocardium. And then the epicardium is the outer layer um, around uh, the, the heart itself. Uh, that, so it's kind of like the, uh, the outer rind on the heart. Now, with that being said, don't confuse that with the pericardium, 
which the pericardium is another sac that surrounds the entire heart uh, that uh, kind of gives it a nice protective layer. So, darn it. So, we'll leave it back here. Okay, got that fixed. Um, so another couple of items here. We have the double uh, walled sac that surrounds the heart. We have the, uh, uh, which is the pericardium, uh, the inner layer being epicardium, outer laying layer, uh, pericardium. So uh, basically what this is saying is you, you're kind of confused possibly by the double walled sac. Uh, it's, it's an extension, an extension of, of the epicardium that comes back around and kind of doubles over uh, to create the pericardium, or the pericardial sac. There's pericardial fluid. That pericardial fluid uh, is a very, very small amount of fluid that lays in between the two layers, um, and it reduces that friction. Uh, when we get something in between the epicardium and the pericardium is when we have uh, uh, some, some issues with uh, pericarditis or a, a pericardial tamponade. Okay, so as I mentioned before, the right atrium receives the deoxygenated blood, the left atrium receives the oxygenated blood from the lungs. Oxygenated blood leaves the left ventricle through the aorta, and the deoxygenated blood returns to the right ventricle, uh, or I'm sorry, deoxygenated blood from the right ventricle uh, enters the pulmonary artery and then travels to the lungs. Uh, remember that uh, the the pulmonary veins and arteries are one of the, the exceptions uh, to what we normally see arteries and veins do. Uh, structurally, they are uh, very, they're still the same, but what they're actually hauling differs. So where most veins transport deoxygenated blood, the pulmonary veins transport oxygenated blood, and the pulmonary arteries transport deoxygenated blood, whereas most arteries transport oxygenated. The four um, valves that we have, uh, and these are uh, actually not in order here. Um, it's first the tricuspid, then the pulmonary, then the bicuspid, then the aorta. So um, we have two semilunar valves, and we have two um, cusped valves. So, uh, the cusped valves, bicuspid, tricuspid valves, those uh, rely on uh, the papillary muscles and chordae tendinae to run them, whereas the semilunar valves, those actually, uh, those will actually uh, force open through the, the uh, contraction of the ventricle. They need the chordae tendinae uh, and the papillary muscles to help reinforce it because when the ventricle contracts, it's pushing a significant amount of blood upward while all of the valves are at the top of the ventricles. So if you look at a picture again, even look at 536, you can see really they're almost all four in a straight line right across the middle of the heart there. Um, so as if the ventricle contracts, it pushes blood upward. If without the chordae tendinae, and the papillary muscles uh, to, to hold those valves closed, blood would backflow into the uh, respective atria. Okay, so back to uh, this picture with the coronary arteries on it. Uh, the coronary arteries come right off the base of the aorta. Uh, they are filled when the heart contracts or has a systole. Uh, the blood rushes then into the aorta and then when the uh, heart is at diastole or at rest, some of that blood then kind of backfills, uh, backfills down towards the heart, kind of uh, retracts or, or retreats backwards towards the heart. That is when those uh, coronary arteries fill. So the coronary arteries fill during relaxation. Um, obviously during uh, a systole, there's a significant amount of pressure that 
changes there. So uh, almost everywhere that we have a coronary artery, we also have a coronary vein. Uh, you can see those represented there in blue, of course. Uh, you can see that they almost uh, perfectly match each other. So we have two major coronary arteries, right and left, uh, and they branch from the aorta and uh, extend along the surface of the heart. They do a pretty good job. I'm going to back up one here. Um, they do a pretty good job of really covering all the surface. You can see how their fingerlings along the way down the front side here, you know, really kind of reach almost and almost touch each other uh, in many cases there. So they do a really good job of getting the, uh, the blood distributed throughout the heart. The back side is the same way. Uh, if you look under right under the word uh, left coronary artery there, um, there's actually the circumflex portion of the left coronary artery. The circumflex portion actually goes around the back side of the heart and it, it really almost comes around and connects with the right coronary artery. It, it doesn't, but it comes close. Uh, the left anterior descending branch that you see here uh, on the right side of this picture. Um, that left anterior descending branch, you'll, you'll hear about the LAD a lot. Uh, that's where a significant number of blockages occur. The LAD is uh, really responsible for circulating a majority of the left ventricle, which we of course know is the primary pumping mechanism that pumps blood to our entire body. somebody getting a uh, blockage high up in the left anterior descending branch uh, is said to have the Widowmaker. Um, it's, it's very high up there and it, uh, it does extensive, extensive damage uh, when a, a heart attack occurs there. All right, so like I mentioned, the aortic valve opens during ventricular systole. Uh, the cusps covering uh, uh, cover the openings of the coronary arteries. So as it comes up, it actually kind of blocks those. And then during diastole, that aortic valve closes, blood then enters the aorta, or from the aorta then enters those coronary arteries. With the coronary circulation, blood flows through those coronary veins and empties right back into the right atrium. It doesn't actually dump into the, uh, it doesn't actually dump into the uh, vena cava. Um, it dumps in through the coronary sinus. And you may hear the term sinus from time to time. Um, ischemia, when we discuss the, the term ischemia, uh, ischemia is when we have, uh, this is actually kind of a bad uh, definition of it here. Uh, it says any obstruction to the coronary blood flow deprives the area, uh, affected area of oxygen. Ischemia is a deprivation of oxygen, but it doesn't necessarily have to be from an obstruction in a classic sense. You can think of it uh, if you get a spasm, a vessel spasm. Uh, if that vessel spasms, then it will um, cause some disruption of blood flow. So I, I think it's, it's maybe not stated the best there. This is going to lead to pain, um, injury of the myocardial cells, potentially infarction and or death um, of that portion uh, of the myocardium. So infarction means death. Uh, the injury of the myocardial cells, uh, the, the ischemia shows itself in the way of pain and discomfort. Uh, we can see, when we do 12 leads, we can see ischemia on these 12 leads, and we can see areas of new infarct, we can see areas of potentially old infarct. So there's an, a number of things uh, that we will see by doing a 12 lead EKG. Um, Reading a 12 lead is a daunting task. It is not an easy thing to do. Paramedics spend a significant amount of time learning about 12 lead EKGs, um, and many, many paramedics still struggle with it. Uh, it, it is a, it's, there are so many variables to it. In fact, when we look at a 12 lead EKG, um, if we showed it to 100 cardiologists, we would get 100 different interpretations. Uh, just because uh, there, there seems to be so many potential variations in there. So there's a few uh, major things that we look for, uh, mainly called ST elevation or a STEMI, uh, ST elevation MI, myocardial infarction. 
um, and that's really kind of a red flag. However, there is a handful of things that mimic a STEMI, a STEMI and, and it just makes it a very, uh, a very complex task to do. So you won't be reading EKGs. Uh, we're not even going to teach you to read uh, what we standardly refer to as a three lead, which is uh, a cardiac monitor. Um, you can take a look at some of those examples of various rhythms that you find uh, in the appendices in the back of the book, um, understanding that, you know, the wiggly lines look a little bit differently. Uh, there's a, a significant amount of pathophysiology that goes along with those. So, um, but we do want you to be applying, acquiring, and transmitting 12 leads whenever possible. Um, if you can get the 12 lead to the hospital a good 15, 20, 30 minutes before the patient gets there, they can be ready. And if that patient needs to go in for what we refer to as a heart cath, heart catheterization, um, then they can be ready to roll that patient in there. Uh, they say time is muscle. <clears throat> so the vascular system in the blood, uh, sometimes referred to as the vasculature, we know that there are three significant uh, major types of blood vessels being the arteries, the veins, and the capillaries. We know that there are also the transitional vessels referred to as the arterioles and the venules. Just to highlight, arteries are thick walled vessels, high pressure blood. Uh, involved there. We have a good uh, representation of the three major types of uh, vessels on page 537. If you look at the bottom of the page, you see the various layers of the different blood vessels there. And uh, the artery is the one to the right in red. And you can see that uh, between the tunica externa, then there's a layer of muscle. There's the tunica media, which is partly muscle and partly elastic membrane, and then there's the tunica intima, and that is the inner lining, the inner layer um, of the artery. When we compare that with the typical vein, um, the tunica media becomes significantly thinner, so there's not nearly as much um, muscle and elasticity to it there. Uh, so it's a, it's a much thinner walled vessel. Remember that veins though typically have uh, valves and we'll come back to that here in a, in a moment. Arterioles, these are our smallest arteries. The smooth muscle tissue, this allows them to constrict and dilate. Capillaries, capillaries is where the business happens. Um, the business, uh, these are microscopic blood vessels. They are usually around a single layer, cell layer thick. Uh, the diameter sometimes is wide enough for red cells to go through in single file or even sometimes the, the red cells have to kind of um, bend in order to fit through there because they're so small. The venules then would be uh, the bridge from the capillary back to the vein and then valves uh, are found in veins that prevent backflow. The systemic circulation is everything from the aorta back through the vena cava. So we'll talk about coronary circulation, um, which is that just there at the heart. We have the pulmonary circulation, which is back and forth from the heart to the lungs. We have the systemic circulation, which is everything uh, in the remainder of the body. So the peripheral circulation and central circulation, things that are closer to the surface is periphery, closer to the core or in the middle is central. Um, for our purposes, peripheral generally is going to mean uh, the uh, things that are found within the extremities, whereas central generally is found within the core. So uh, we have large, uh, large blood supply. So uh, in, in some respects, they consider things like um, the major deep veins and arteries, of course, uh, to be central circulation. Uh, sometimes there will be certain types of uh, long-term IVs such as a uh, PIC line, which is a peripherally inserted central catheter. If you didn't know what PIC stood for, it's P-I-C-C. -C. The PIC line is peripherally inserted central catheter. Usually they go in through the antecubital fossa and then we'll feed this very long catheter all the way up and basically dump it into the uh, superior vena cava.
All right, in shock, uh, that peripheral circulation gets sacrificed to redirect blood to the central circulation. We commonly call that shunting. So when a person goes into shock, we try to move a little extra blood to the central to uh, uh, preserve the vital organs. The veins of the gastrointestinal system, uh, they enter the hepatic portal vein, travel through the liver before being returned to the general systemic venous system. These are another uh, example of where veins don't quite operate how we think they all do. There are two major portal systems, one around uh, your the base of your brain, and there's another then, of course, in the liver and gastrointestinal system called the hepatic portal system. <clears throat> These are actually where the veins don't do uh, don't do a straight shot back to the heart. They actually do a bypass. So, um, you know, like a like a, a bypass loop of the interstate. They don't qu go straight through where they're supposed to. Uh, they route things around uh, in another another route. Um, so they, uh, you know, have a very specific function for doing this, and it's to uh, draw the nutrients out of the gastrointestinal tract and uh, move them to the liver. All right, another couple of oddball things that maybe uh, happen here. Uh, the, the fetal uh, mother, uh, maternal, fetal maternal circulation, um, where the mother circulation actually feeds things to the fetal circulation. Uh, they do not actually come into contact um, in almost every case. Uh, they don't actually come into contact. There's a thin layer of membrane between them uh, and they will kind of, uh, you know, kind of kind of very similar to say the alveoli and the capillaries where you know, it's, it's very very thin layer between things jump across from you know the waist. Uh, it uh, diffuses across over into the maternal circulation. The nutrients diffuse over across into the uh, fetal circulation, uh, oxygen and, and carbon dioxide do the same, um, and uh, that's kind of how that system works. Remember that the fetal circulation itself is is significantly different as well, because the lungs do not get used until the baby is born. So the lungs sit dormant. They're one of the last things to develop. The lungs sit dormant until that baby is born. So through the umbilical cord, uh, there are a couple of shortcuts that are uh, created, and uh, some of the, the blood is routed then down uh, to the legs, some of the blood is routed upwards to the body, uh, and then some of that blood actually bypasses the lungs altogether, goes through some of the holes and uh, temporary openings uh, around the aorta and in the atria of the heart and uh, then circulates uh, the baby that way. Once the baby is born, typically the pressure change from being squeezed out the doggy door as well as taking some breaths and crying vigorously closes a lot of these shortcuts because the pressure change. And so uh, we'll get to that uh, much later in the, uh, the course but it's uh, something to, to kind of keep in mind. Pulmonary circulation, um, we know we've discussed this, pulmonary circulation leaves the right side of the heart to the pulmonary artery, returns to the pulmonary veins, and then there in the lungs that's where the business happens, where the carbon dioxide is removed and oxygen is added. To, to, to review blood a little bit more here, uh, we'll take a, a few uh, looks here. We have white blood cells, which we have represented in the five um, big cells uh, on the left side here. The platelets in the bottom of the second column of cells there is not white blood cells. The platelets themselves uh, are their own function. Um, and then you can also see this picture on 538. And then, of course, we have the red blood cells. So in this uh, grand scheme of things, we got a test tube full of blood there, we take a look at it. Uh, we have roughly 45% of the blood is red blood cells. Around 1% of our blood 
is the other solid components being white cells and platelets and roughly 54 55 percent of our blood is simply the plasma so or the soup that it's all dissolved in when we see blood initially uh, the uh, because of the turbulence that the blood is under, it's all intermixed. So we don't see it look like this, this test tube that they have here. When people get certain blood tests done, they'll pull, you know, take the blood out, put it in a, a vial much like this, and stick it in what's called a centrifuge. And that centrifuge spins it, spins it very, very, very fast. And so a significant amount of uh, force that's applied to it. And so then it will make all those solid elements settle. And uh, so when you see that, uh, you will, you know, when, you, when you see the blood uh, spun out like that, you will see it separate, like very similar to this. Um, sometimes you don't quite see the white cells and the platelets. Sometimes you see a significant layer of, of uh, fats and cholesterols. It's kind of gross. But, um, so that's our, uh, our components of our blood there. Uh, remember that within all of this, there's also sometimes electrolytes, enzymes, fats, and proteins, carbohydrates. There's gases, which we have that are either attached to the red cells or dissolved in the plasma. So now um, I'll take just a, uh, a brief second here to discuss the white cells with you just a little bit. Um, we're not going to spend a lot of time on it. Uh, right now, uh, but the white cells have various functions depending on what uh, they really do, whether they uh, are primarily dispatched in bacterial cases, some of them really have a more of a viral nature, some of them are very big in, uh, in fungal, when we see fungal things, some of them uh, have a lot to do with uh, allergic reactions. So. Uh, and, and they have various various ways uh, that they uh, perform. You know, some of them actually will go and they'll, they'll try to eat up the offending cells and the offending organisms. Others will try to buddy up with it and try to uh, basically dissolve it. So uh, the, the white cells really have kind of an uh, interesting, uh, interesting job. I mean, they, the way they work is, is very, uh, very interesting and unique. Uh, when you are doing some ER time, you may hear doctors request uh, that the patient have a CBC done. <clears throat> and a CBC is a complete blood count. And with the CBC, uh, they're actually looking for the different components. So how much of each thing is in there? And they may also say CBC with diff. And the diff is a differential. And the differential looks at the development stages of these various uh, vessel or various uh, uh, cells um, and uh, looks at the very specific numbers of the, the different types of white cells. So as opposed to them saying, well, your white count is, you know, they tell you that you have a white count of 2,000. Um, so a white count of 2,000, that simply means all your white cells together, you have roughly 2,000 in this sample, or the sample size. Whereas if they say diff, they're going to look at, you have X amount of monocytes, X amount of basophils, X amount of, of eosinophils, uh, a certain number of neutrophils, and of course, a number of lymphocytes. So uh, that's uh, some, some terms you may see thrown around in there. Um, and when you're in the ER, uh, take advantage of, of that opportunity to learn and ask the doc, okay, so ex can you uh, take a moment and, and explain to me uh, the, uh, this, the CBC here, you know, and, and what, it, what it means. And in most cases, if, if, you're, if you are taking advantage of the opportunity to learn something and showing initiative to learn, uh, the, many, many, many of those doctors are going to love to... Uh, to talk to you about these things. So now there's a few other terms uh, that kind of get thrown with the blood. Um, uh, a couple of those things uh, that we'll maybe uh, talk about for just a moment. Things like the hemoglobin and the hematocrit. Uh, they don't. 
they don't spend a, a lot of time uh, discussing those. But remember, hemoglobin is the, uh, the iron-based uh, substance that is found in the blood. Um, it's a protein that uh, is what oxygen and several other gases bind to. Um, hemoglobin also carries some of that carbon dioxide, uh, but uh, it's primarily the, uh, the oxygen attachment device. Uh, there's another thing called hematocrit, and hematocrit uh, compares the number of red cells to the full, uh, the percentage of red cells to the remainder of the blood. So they may ask for an H and H. H and H is the hemoglobin and the hematocrit. So they're trying to determine the patient's oxygen carrying capabilities. And then don't forget the, the platelets. The platelets are our primary um, clotting factors that will go in and start to um, plug holes. And then there are other hormones and other uh, chemical mediators in the body that get dispatched when the body understand un, when the body sees that there's bleeding going on. That will then start to um, help bind the platelets and help solidify. Uh, the clots. All right, so perfusion, cardiac output, blood pressure, a few things to talk about there. Uh, the um, perfusion is the circulation of oxygenated blood cells to the body. So obviously we've talked about this in the shock chapter, so we, we don't need to dwell much on that. Um, a lot of your perfusion depends on an adequate blood pressure, and that blood pressure actually is more than just a systolic versus a diastolic. Um, there is a misprint in the textbook uh, when it talks about the mean arterial pressure. If you look at the mean arterial pressure, um, they are looking at the uh, represented by the diastolic blood pressure plus one-third of the pulse pressure, which is the, the pulse pressure is the difference between the systolic and the diastolic. So in 120 over 80, that would be 40. So the map uh, for a patient with 120 over 80, one-third of 40 is roughly 13. So 13 on top of 80 would make a map of 93. When you see the description at the top of the second column on 539, uh, it tells you this. But then when they give you a, a uh, equation to represent it down below, they leave off uh, adding the uh, one-third of the pulse pressure to the diastolic. The diastolic part is left off. So they're telling you MAP equals one-third SBP minus DBP. Well, you have SBP minus DBP, um, one-third of that. You still need to add that to back to the DBP. So you would, right behind that, put a plus DBP. <clears throat> so with that being clarified, um, that adequate blood pressure depends on our blood volume available, the output of blood from the heart, and the capacity of the blood vessels. So to discuss that a little bit more, we have a few other items that we can look um, at here in the text. Uh, the, oh, there's another one. Um, the blood pressure represented uh, by the MAP uh, is, is calculated by the following equation, which is uh, MAP equals CO times SVR. It should not be P, it should be R. So um, SVR, systemic vascular resistance. So the systemic va vascular resistance is how tight your vessels are. So a person who has, uh, well, so, well let's, let's take, for example, the person with um, spinal shock, neurogenic shock. We know that they lose control of their ability to have uh, nice, tense blood vessels to help control blood flow. Uh, so they have a very low SVR, systemic vascular resistance, a very low SVR. And uh, so their blood pressure uh, is very low. Their mean arterial pressure, in turn, is very low. 
So another way to look at the mean arterial pressure is your cardiac output multiplied by your systemic vascular resistance. Um, cardiac output, we know that cardiac output, we've talked about this before, cardiac output is the stroke volume times the heart rate. So stroke volume, remember each contraction, um, each contraction of the blood of the heart can, uh, ejects X amount of blood. That is the stroke volume. We'll say 30, 40, 50, 60 milliliters, depending on your health and your size and whatnot, times your heart rate. So if you eject 60 milliliters of blood every time your heart contracts and your heart's beating 60 times per minute, it's 3,600 milliliters or 3.6 liters uh, per minute is your cardiac output also known as your minute volume, um, or your heart, or your cardiac minute volume. Minute volume usually gets applied actually to uh, respiratory. Stroke volume is determined by subtracting the amount of blood in the uh, blood left in the left ventricle after the contraction, or the end systolic volume, from the amount of blood that was in the left ventricle before contraction, or the end diastolic volume. It's also called the preload. Um, and so stroke volume is represented as such uh, that they show in your textbook. Honestly, this is probably not something that you need to, to uh, put a lot of uh, thought into. Um, it's really not something. I, mean, I think that's kind of a, a no-brainer there. Um, and then the ejection fraction. Uh, this is a term that you will hear from time to time. So a measure of the heart function is the ejection fraction, uh, which is the stroke volume uh, expressed as a percentage of the EDV, so the end diastolic volume. So when they're looking at uh, ejection fractions, typically people have a 55 to 70 percent, meaning that they get rid of 55 to 70 percent of that blood. Uh, the ejection fraction can be substantially reduced following an MI. Well, let's stop and digest that for half a second. Think about having a MI in your left ventricle. Once you have an MI, that what what has infarcted is dead. Okay, it dies. Now, we know that when we have some dead skin, usually something else grows in around it. When we ha when we lose skin, so let's say we have a uh, we have an, uh, a burn. Let's say a, a deep deep burn. Skin will grow, start to grow back in there, but it is scar tissue. So that scar tissue takes up a section or a chunk of your ventricle. Well, that scar tissue, just like your scars that you may have on your body, doesn't work like the, the other skin does. It's not as pliable. It doesn't conduct electricity like it should. It doesn't beat with the, the rest of the band. So if we take a chunk of that heart out of there, a chunk of that myocardium out of there, then it will um, reduce the ejection fraction because that part of the heart doesn't contract. Afterload, uh, this is the pressure within the arterial system. So we talk about preload. Preload is the blood that's filling the heart and the heart has ready to pump out. The afterload is what the heart has to press against. So a person with hypertension has a very high afterload. The heart has to work harder to combat that. Blood pressure, uh, blood pressure measurement, that's the amount of the pressure exerted against the arterial walls. So when the heart contracts or has a systole, the amount of pressure within the arteries is the systolic. And then when the heart relaxes or goes into diastole mode, the amount of pressure remaining um, in the system while the heart is, is re refilling um, and preparing to uh, contract again is the diastolic. So that's where our blood pressure comes from. <laughs> and basically just as I mentioned, uh, the normal range for a systolic blood pressure for adults is typically 100 to 140. The normal range for a diastolic is typically 60 to 90. We don't like to see diastolics above 90. Uh, it's a lot of uh, uh, meaning that there's a, 
uh, a lot of extra work that the heart has to do. The heart has to work harder. Essentially look at diastole or the diastolic pressure as the afterload. That's what the heart has to, to work against. Um, so it has to overcome at least that much. Previously, they were very, uh, they were pretty strict on that 140 over 90 being the border to hypertension. Uh, there have been some recent uh, scientific studies released that say maybe they're being just a little too strict on it. Uh, and maybe saying that it may be permissive to allow them to be a little higher than that, particularly if they're older. So, hyper and hypotension. Um, we've talked about hypotension. Uh, hypotension has come up several times for us uh, in, the, in the course already. Uh, things, uh, we know hypertension is, is high blood pressure and hypotension is low blood pressure. Typically, hypotension is seen in several different types of shock um, so or hypoperfusion. Uh, hypertension typically uh, is an issue with either having very, very tight vessels, and those vessels might be tight or may be constricted because there's buildup of plaque on the inside. Maybe there's excessive amounts of water in the blood. Uh, maybe uh, the heart is uh, uh, working uh, actually against itself creating excessive pressures. Um, so there's various reasons why a person may have hypertension. Hypotension, some people deal just fine with having uh, a little bit lower blood pressure, um, particularly smaller, skinny, uh, little people. Uh, we typically consider somebody with a uh, blood pressure lower than 100 systolic, an adult lower than 100 systolic to be hypotensive and potentially over 140 or over 90 to be hypertensive. We don't get terribly concerned with a lower diastolic. All right, to move to the next uh, step here and talk about cardiac electrophysiology. Um, so hold on to your seats for a moment here because it's going to get rough. Uh, when we're talking about electricity in the heart, uh, we're really talking about uh, the stimulus for the muscle to contract. We can see a graphic representation here. Understand though that if you would dissect somebody's heart like uh, and, and try to find these structures, uh, they're not a vis really a visible structure that you can just dice open the heart and say, oh look, here's the SA node. Um, it, you have to look at it microscopically really to see the differences in the tissue. So we have, note, uh, I'm, I'm going to cite the, the path here. Uh, the heart's own intrinsic pacemaker is the SA node. That SA node uh, starts the whole process. The SA node gets some stimulus from some other nerves, such as the vagus nerve, and it also gets some stimulation and uh, influence by several hormones, such as, we'll say, epinephrine, which we know is a sympathomimetic drug, or um, it's a a beta drug. So the SA node starts the process. It discharges uh, its electrical wave. Uh, it feeds then through the various intranodal and intraatrial pathways. Some of it goes over to the left side and, and, contra and uh, starts uh, the, the contraction process on the left. Most of it uh, feeds then through the, the right side, reconvenes down at the AV node. I don't like the way that they show AV junction here. Um, the AV junction actually is um, down, actually below the AV. But uh, so the AV node is a backup pacemaker. Um, within the AV junction, it will cause the uh, the electricity to pause. It holds it up. It's kind of like a resistor. Uh, holds it up for just a, a split second and then dispatches it down through the bundle of his. The bundle of his is the, uh, the major, uh, we'll, we'll say, uh, gate uh, into the ventricles. And then from the bundle of his, it is then sent down uh, the left and right bundle branches. Those left and right bundle branches uh, feed the respective sides of the heart. And then dispatches the electricity through the Purkinje fibers uh, and the Purkinje system. Uh, the Purkinje system actually is a backup, 
pacemaker. That's a it's like a the last last ditch pacemaker. So um, and then it dispatches the electricity actually from the bottom of the heart through those Purkinje fibers, and then sends that electricity upwards towards the bottom or towards the uh, towards the atria. So it kind of gives it uh, it squeezes from the top down to the middle, and then from the bottom up to the middle. So we get these electrical activity of these cardiac cells. Um, they have very, uh, cardiac muscle cells, remember, have very specific um, properties. Uh, they, they do a great job conducting electricity. They also can make their own electricity when necessary, particularly if they're not getting the stimulus from somebody else. So that electrical uh, activity of the cells causes contraction of the muscles. Uh, that electrical activity is conducted also to the surface of the skin. It's a very, 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 very small amount, but it's nonetheless there. And when we use electrodes uh, from our EKG, we can then um, get a graphic representation of that electricity. Um, what I want you to, to understand for a moment about uh, this is that the, elect the, the waves we see on our screen is really a mathematical calculation or representation of electricity. Um, anything that is going towards, the, if the majority of the electricity is headed towards an electrode, it is an upright wave. Anything that is headed in the opposite direction from that electrode, so if the, the major amount of electricity is headed away, then it goes downward. Um, anything that goes perpendicular to the electrode actually is a flat line. So when it looks at this, it's, you know, we have electricity flowing in a lot of different directions. So it's really looking at what is the major direction that electricity is heading. And that's kind of what we see on, on the, the screen. So <clears throat> we have uh, the various uh, types of cardiac cells, whether they be pacemaker, uh, they also have, uh, we have some conductive ones, and then the contractile ones, they all work uh, together and produce a heartbeat. Uh, the electrical stimulus is our various pacemaker cells, when those can be the SA, the AV, and the Purkinje fibers. And then automaticity is a term that gets used uh, uh, that says that the heart has the ability to create its own electrical impulse. Remember, all your other muscles require stimulus from the nervous system. And the SA node is our primary uh, pacemaker site. So electrical impulses then travel down through the heart uh, based on the flow of electrically charged particles or ions through the channels on the cell membrane. So I will reawaken you to um, our good friend the sodium potassium pump. Um, so that sodium potassium pump Remember, when we have uh, the, the resting uh, membrane potential means that everything's set. It's ready to go. The sodium is mostly on the outside. The potassium is mostly on the inside. And then when the heart is ready to contract, the gates open up. The sodium rushes in. And when the sodium rushes in, it starts to push some of that potassium out. Um, and then it resets back to resting membrane potential because we have the sodium potassium pump kicking in to return it back to normal. So that is referred to as the action potentials. The action potential is the process of depolarizing and repolarizing and it's representative uh, or it's the represent, represented on our screen uh, on the waves of the EKG. Now, we also have a couple other things that kind of play a part in this. It's mostly sodium and potassium that we talk about, but there are a few others. Um, kind of a, a sidekick to sodium is calcium. Um, and calcium has its own channels that it goes through. Uh, and uh, because if you look at, uh, look at the bottom of 540 in your textbook, uh, second column is like the last sentence, really. Uh, of that. It starts to talk about positively charged ions of all the cardiac function 
are sodium, potassium, and calcium. We'll look at calcium's representate what its chemical or its uh, um, abbreviation. It's Ca plus plus. So there are two positively charged there. So it really helps upset the apple cart when it comes rushing in because it has an it has even more of an electrical influence than sodium. However, the number the amount of calcium we have is generally much lower. Now you may also hear of something called calcium channel blockers. You know, of a person that's on a drug called cardiazem or deltiazem, that is a calcium channel blocker. Um, and calcium channel blockers can then close some of these so it's not as easy for calcium to rush in. People who have very high levels of calcium, they have wide open calcium channels, they very typically get tachycardia and they get hypertension because the heart just goes kind of into overdrive. So we can block that. Um, we also have the negatively charged ion of chloride. We know that chloride hangs out with both uh, potassium and with sodium and with calcium. So uh, we get sodium chloride, potassium chloride, and calcium chloride, um, all where we have so a little bit of, uh, of a negative influence. So, so this electrical, uh, the electricity normally flows from the area where the net overall charge is positive to where the net overall charge is negative. So it's going to be much higher outside, much lower on the inside, and that changes as we see the channels open up. Okay, so cardiac electrophysiology, the SA node, it sets our normal regular rate, what we call the intrinsic rate, as 60 to 100 beats per minute. Um, interestingly enough, doesn't that match up with our normal adult heart rate, which would be 60 to 100 times per minute. Uh, that impulse gets delayed at the AV junction um, and the AV node there and then it's allowed, uh, allows the atria time to contract to finish filling the ventricles and then the ventricles fire because if they all fired simultaneously they would almost be competing against each other and so instead of the atria helping the ventricles they would they would be almost pushing up against one another the ventricles would obviously win so if for some reason the SA node decides to quit and this actually does happen on a on a fairly regular basis. Then the AV node is the backup pacemaker. Um, it's also referred to as the AV junction. And that AV node has an intrinsic pacemaker rate of uh, 40 to 60 beats per minute. So 40 to 60. You may also hear occasionally people talking about a junctional rhythm. And if it's a junctional rhythm, that junctional rhythm has uh, we have the AV junction that has taken over and it is dictating uh, the heart rate. Now just because it the intrinsic rate is 40 to 60 doesn't mean it always is that, but that's very, 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 very common for junctional rhythms. And then finally, if the SA quits, the AV quits, then the Purkinje fibers can be the last ditch. And those Purkinje fibers um, have an intrinsic rate of 20 to 40 beats per minute. Um, some textbooks list that as 15 to 40. So 15 to 40, 20 to 40, either one's appropriate. Um, and uh, it's really, really slow, and it's really, really wide and weird, uh, but occasionally those do come into play. So if you hear about things such as escape rhythms, basically an escape rhythm means that a backup uh, generator is working. So we also occasionally have ectopics, ectopic pacemakers. Um, ectopics or ectopy, we talk about ectopy from time to time. Um, ectopy is something that is out of place. Something that is ectopic is out of place. You hear about ectopic pregnancy. Ectopic pregnancy means that the pregnancy is outside of where it should be. It's not in the uterus. So, um, so an ectopic pacemaker is the unusual or out of place pacemaker. So sometimes there is just one cell in the heart that has just decided I'm taking over and he tries to override the SA, the AV, and then all of the other Purkinje fibers itself.
So that ectopic pacemaker, or when we hear people talk about PVCs or PACs or PJCs, that is an ectopic beat. So here we have um, what they call normal sinus rhythm. I prefer to call it regular sinus rhythm. Uh, I, I don't think I'm, I don't like to use the word normal because there is uh, sometimes very difficult to say what actually is normal. So a normal sinus rhythm or a regular sinus rhythm, um, the characteristics of this, um, and I don't expect anybody to memorize this, but uh, um, we have the P wave, which let me see if I can highlight that here. Okay, so there's our P wave. Uh, the P wave is a usually rounded upright little structure there. And that P wave, um, and it's actually from where it leaves the line. So, you know, if I were to be probably a little bit more uh, appropriate, I'd have to, well, I don't know that I can get it down small enough, but just where it comes off the line makes the bump and returns back to the line. So the P wave is the atrial kick, the atria firing. So um, so then we see it pause for a moment, because remember we said it pauses at the AV junction, so it goes back to the baseline. Then we have the QRS. The QRS, it's actually, the Q is, is a downward, uh, downward wave before the upward wave. So the downward, the first downward wave is the Q. And in this case, we have a Q. Not always do we have Qs. Um, then we have the R wave, which is the first positive or upright. Most predominant feature on here is the R wave. And then we have an S wave, which is the, the uh, downward wave that follows the R. So uh, we ha actually have a QRS here on this. That is the atria, I'm sorry, the ventricle. Uh, depolarization. So we see it initially kind of go downward because it's actually kind of spreading out um, away from the electrode. Then it has a very significant amount of discharge directly in, in the way of the, uh, the electrode. So that's why we see it go down. And then it turns and kind of goes around the corner. So it goes back down again. And then after that, we have, we'll erase that. After that, we have the ST segment here. And the ST goes from the S wave through the T wave. And the T wave is that second kind of rounded off wide bump. Um, and that is representative of the heart repolarizing or going back to its uh, uh, normal state. So, so if we wanted to... Uh, do that again, P, Q, wow, look at that, I'm like in kindergarten, R, um, this deflection here, or this one, here we go, S, and then T. So that's your PQRST. Now there are other, other parts to this that we uh, are concerned with, but uh, there's your, uh, your, your quick, uh, quick lesson. All right, get away from that. Let's go back to normal. All right, so the EKG, ECG, either one is appropriate. Uh, it's a diagnosis, a diagnostic tool used in cardiac emergencies. Um, so myocardial ischemia, infarction, dysrhythmia, so on and so forth. The, the electrocardiogram is uh, the graphical representation uh, of the uh, the electrical activities. When we do cardiac monitoring, uh, we usually will throw a patient on a three lead, four lead, five lead monitor, and it helps us just kind of keep an eye on their heart. I want you to think of it as if you have to wear glasses. Anyone who wears glasses or contacts um, can can relate to this. If you take your glasses off many of us can kind of see what's going on, 
that's the three lead, four lead, five lead monitor. But when you put your glasses on, or let, let's even go a step further, you know, we may be able to see something off in the distance with our good normal vision, whether we're wearing glasses or whatever. Um, but if we get a set of binoculars, we can see it really good. Well, that's what 12 lead EKGs do. Is it's a very clean, very, uh, a very good picture of what's going on, as opposed to seeing it from afar. So, and that's what cardiac monitoring is. So, when we do the cardiac monitoring, we're watching the rate, the rhythm, uh, which pacemaker site, any delays that there are, and then the waveforms. This is the amount and the direction of electricity is conducted through the heart, and the waveforms are the PQRST waves, uh, like I talked about, ST segments and so on. So this uh, goes through and it tells you about uh, those things again, the P wave, atrial depolarization. I didn't mention the PR interval, uh, mainly because it really isn't important uh, for you guys to know this, but uh, the PR interval is that pause in between uh, the P uh, and the R. And that pause uh, is, is important because it helps to determine whether there's some sort of a block. Uh, and when I say block, I mean an electrical block, not a, uh, a block in the uh, circulation. The QRS, we're, very con we're also very concerned with how wide that QRS is. And when you noticed, uh, when we looked at the picture, uh, the preceding picture there, uh, they, it was very narrow QRS. It's very spiky. You flip the page. Uh, in your textbook to 554, I'm sorry, 545, 545, um, we're looking at the uh, the width of the QRS up there at the top. You note that they're pretty pretty slim. Well, that's that's the way it's supposed to be. It's supposed to fire through there pretty quickly. So, and then QRS, ventricular depolarization, T wave is ventricular repulse. So electrical activity does not give information about the strength of cardiac contractions. In fact, the heart may not be contracting at all. So commit that to memory because that can get you into trouble. This is one of the things that we, we, we harp on and we harp on and we harp on that there is, you, you treat your patient, not your monitor. Uh, because we can be looking at all kinds of cool, fun, electrical things, uh, and it doesn't mean that a dang thing is happening actually to move any blood. So when we pay more attention to our machines and less attention to our patients, that's when patients have very bad outcomes. Uh, so just because there's a number on the screen, just because there is a waveform on the screen, does not mean that there is a pulse to go with it. You have to have working muscles and working electricity in order for the whole system to work. Despite critical decreases in cardiac output, unorganized electrical activity can appear. Just what I said. There can be all kinds of electricity all over the place, and it can even look like a perfectly normal rhythm, but the heart muscle has said, screw it. I am not playing with you. You can try telling me what to do. It's kind of like, you know, they put the, the muscle put its uh, fingers in its ears and says, scream all you want, I ain't listening. So what other information do we need to be looking for in the assessment? If we want to use the, electro, the cardiac monitor, that's great. We have to use the other diagnostic tools and really more specifically vital signs to, to really truly tell us the picture. So take a pulse, put your fingers on the patient's pulse, and watch. Does it match? Count it out. Does it match the number you see on the screen? Does every time there's a spike on the screen, you feel a pulsation through the patient's artery? Uh, put the, the, the pulse ox on them. Does the pulse ox number match the number on the screen and match the number that you're counting by taking their pulse? If so, hey, great. We've got a good way to watch this. It doesn't mean it's going to stay that way forever, but we got something. Okay, I think I'm going to actually split this one into two uh, parts because this is a, a larger um, lecture, so we're going to cut off here.